All right, chapter four is on system hacking. And in many cases in this chapter, you'll see that a lot of the stuff is malicious. It's about spreading Trojans. You know, it's about doing denial of service attacks. It's a, it's a number of other things. But it's still ethical hacking, right? So we'll look at cracking passwords, attacking sites, you know, using spyware, installing key loggers, escalating privileges, hiding files, as well as executing applications and detecting root kits. So some of the stuff we're going to do from the point of view of the attacker, other stuff to learn how attackers work, other stuff to figure out how we can create countermeasures against these things. And then we'll talk about hiding stuff via steganography and other methods of hiding our tracks. Right, the methodology steps once again. Now we're in the gaining access phase, right? We finished the scanning phase. Here we want to what? We want to get into the box. We want to get access as a user. We want to escalate privileges as necessary. We can get access via a variety of ways, through wired access, wireless access, internet access, setting up rogue APs, compromising software, etc. If we want to get accounts, what's the best way to do it? brute force or crack passwords, right? We can try to guess people's passwords. So we find information about them, right? And then we can try to test their passwords. You can get programs over the internet to try to crack or guess any kind of password or brute force it, including Microsoft Word, Excel, and other Office passwords. Many other types of application level passwords, such as the passwords that lock PDF files from Adobe, et cetera. Some of these they actually want you to pay for, and you can buy them as utilities. Most of the time when passwords are uh, stored within files and databases these days, they're not stored in plain text. Why? It's just too easy if you leave them lying around in regular unencrypted form. So when passwords are usually stored, are they stored encrypted? Anybody? Do we store passwords encrypted? Nope, we store them hashed. Hash actually destroys the password. We have to destroy it in order to keep it. And it just keeps a checksum, cryptographic checksum of that. But we can tell if somebody knows their password by doing what? We take their password. We have them compute the same hash on it, right? And then they take the result and they give it to us and say, OK, this is my end result. And I compare it with mine and say, yep, they match. We both did the same hash, we did the same you know, algorithm, et cetera, and we know that we both have the same password. You can send those over the network. You never have to send the password over the network. You never even have to send an encrypted password, which might be vulnerable to reverse engineering or cracking, right? So hashes are generally much safer, but there are ways to brute force or reverse engineer hashes. We talked about rainbow tables this morning. That's one way to do it, right? Hunting for the hashed password. Any questions? Other ways to get passwords, right? Ask people for them. That's the easiest way. Steal them off the wire or off a wireless network. Log them right at somebody's keyboard. So you get malicious software on their box, and you have it log the keystrokes as they type them. We have software and hardware key loggers. Hardware ones you have to insert in line with the keyboard, right? So normally that would be where you have public computers, and you can get access to their keyboard. You can hide them. Spoof the login phishing, which is another way of asking them for it, but you're impersonating via email. And then trying to watch people type in their password via shoulder surfing or videotaping them. You know, if you're looking at places where people are using computers out in the open, one thing to do is use a camcorder, zoom in on their fingers, record that, then go back and replay that slowly. What's acoustic crypt analysis? Actually listening to you them typing in the keys. It's, this is even better if you're doing it on a phone because you can record the DTMF tones that they press if they're typing in pins or passwords over a, a phone keypad. Just some of the tools to do this. Remember we talked about John the Ripper this morning. We've got, this should be Kane and Abel, right? Brutus, John the Ripper, Loaf Crack uh, 5 and 6, and Rainbow Crack. There are other password crackers out there as well including one that we have in a lab, which is a uh, replacement for loaf crack. So wherever we have weak encryption or weak hashing, and most of the hashing algorithms eventually do find themselves vulnerable to some type of weakness, we can take advantage of that. The big weakness that you'll find today <coughs> with password hashing is it's susceptible to a space-time trade-off. 
we're willing to trade space for time, and then we can crack those hash passwords quickly just by setting up, you know, several gigabyte rainbow hash table. You can get those hashes from rainbowcrack.com. A lot of websites don't even encrypt the passwords that they send across the web. This was illustrated recently via FireSheep, right? What does FireSheep do? Right, and so if you're on regular wireless networks, you're not running HTTPS, you can watch people log into their MySpace accounts or log, watch them log into Facebook and other things if they're using the insecure version of those web pages. They're not going to HTTPS. You can even, you know, steal those accounts from them. So always look for HTTPS. There are programs you can use to strip the HTTPS and play man in the middle, right? So here somebody's doing it to American Express. You're connecting to a site, you think it's secure because you've got an HTTPS URL, right? But what's happening is you're actually supplying your American Express credentials to somebody else who's stealing them. This is the you know, web transcript of what's happening here. And you'll see that this is a post command to online.americanexpress.com. These are all the parameters in that post. Notice that there are multiple ones and they're separated here, you know, usually by ampersand signs. So th this is my destination web page, uh, HTTP colon slash slash www.99americanexpress.com. And then down here, you'll see that my login user ID is Warlock. My password is AmexPW. And then there's various other parameters that we're sending inline. So the first generation of uh, <coughs> Windows and even earlier DOS Landman servers used a hash which was very insecure called the Landman hash, right? It didn't use a good salt or an initial seed value. Uh, it started off using seven character, you know, passwords. Eventually allowed 14 character passwords, but they're really just two groups of seven. And it converts everything to uppercase. So it didn't matter whether you typed in your password in upper or lowercase. At that point, it was case insensitive. So we have here the user types in Seattle 1 in a mixture of upper and lowercase. That got converted to Seattle. Why? Truncated at seven characters and then uppercased to all uppercase characters. And then here we add the one in the next group of seven. We pad that, so those asterisks represent the padding, and those each become separate keys. The weakness in this is it becomes really easy to brute force decrypt, you know, or reverse engineer the hash of those first seven characters. There's no random initial seed value. Sometimes you'll see this also called an IV or an initialization vector. There's no salt. We're feeding in what? A constant instead into the DES algorithm. We're using an encryption algorithm, an encrypt function, to generate the hashes. And then we just concatenate the results of doing that to each of these two groups of seven, right? That's then stored as the LM hash. So it's not really a hash. It's not a secure hash has a very limited character set. Remember, it's only uppercase letters and, and uh, digits. So we're limited in terms of the number of symbols. It's always padded to exactly 14 characters, which is really broken into two groups of seven character passwords, right? So your maximum number of passwords, while this looks like a very large number, this is in scientific notation or this exponentiation here, that's not really a large number today with the computing power that we have it's possible to go through that quite fast, and it's unsalted. Salting allows us to add additional probability space to passwords. Remember, we can tack things on. And the same password will appear quite different. Right? So Alice and uh, Cecil here actually have the same password, but their cryptid version, their hashed version here, appears different because we salted them using a different random number. Right? We added some number to each one, known as assault. NT hash generation is better, but it still was not good in NT version 1, what's called NTLM version 1, and as a result, people were able to crack it. It hashes the password and stores it. So here we have 
Seattle 1, we run the MD4, which stands for Message Digest 4 hash algorithm. We end up with a Unicode password. What's Unicode mean? It can support 8-bit characters. It can support international character sets, right? What's UTF-8? Right, it's a Unicode character, universal text format or font 8. 